So I'd like to start, Rory, just by asking you, for those on the call that haven't read Alchemy, can you just take us through the main points of, of, of the book? <laughs> yes, I suppose the book starts with a, a discussion about the drink Red Bull. Um, <coughs> and my argument is, if you take most highly successful ventures, they don't really make sense in advance. So if, you, if you'd sat down 30 years ago or 20 years ago and you said, we want to compete with Coca-Cola, you know, for the last uh, 50 years, Coke has been the most popular uh, cold, non-alcoholic drink uh, in the world, with the exception of water. Uh, we quite like a bit of that action. Um, how can we go about getting it? Uh, you'd immediately start with three perfectly logical assumptions. Nobody would actually dispute this. No one would question it. And you'd proceed from the basis that the drink that would dislodge Coke or would, would significantly challenge Coke would taste nicer than Coke, cost less than Coke, and come in a really big can. So people got a lot of refreshment for their money. And yet, when you look back, the most successful attempt to compete with Coke, Red Bull, uh, comes in a tiny can. Uh, it costs a fortune and it tastes disgusting. And by the way, when I say it tastes disgusting, that isn't a subjective point. They actually researched it and they researched it with a company which only researches uh, carbonated drinks and the taste of carbonated drinks. And they received the report, this is the worst drink we've researched in the entire history of our company. And normally, you know, people say it's not really for me. It's a bit cloying. It's more for kids. Um, in the case of Red Bull, um, respondents replied with comments like, I wouldn't drink this piss if you paid me to. Now, you know, nobody, if James, D I'll freely admit, OK, I've got a fairly large appetite for counterintuitive ideas. But if James Dyson had come to me 20 years ago and said, I'm thinking of launching a 750 pound vacuum cleaner, I would have said, James, mate, um, let's just pause for a second, right? Let's look at the vacuum cleaner market. It's a distress purchase. It's a grudge purchase. Generally, people only replace their vacuum cleaner when the old one breaks down or they move out of rental accommodation and have to buy their own, um, you know, OK, the top end of the market is probably Miele around the 200 and something pound mark. The bottom end is the Henry. Pretty good vacuum cleaner. That's around 100 pounds. Um, there's no there's nothing here to indicate that a market for what you're proposing exists. In any case, anybody who could afford a 700 pound vacuum cleaner probably employs someone to use it and doesn't actually vacuum their own home. And I would have said all that perfectly confidently. And then if James had replied, but wait, you haven't heard about my 400 pound hairdryer, I would have had him escorted out of the building as an obvious lunatic. But he's a billionaire. I'm not. <laughs> OK. And there's something fascinating going on here, which is we always start. This is why I think and Hayek and a few other economists spotted this. The role of the entrepreneur is so important. Because. To some extent, I would argue that within a larger organization, the need for everything you do to make perfect sense in advance <coughs> is a constraint on creativity. The fact that you <coughs> the fact that you have to go to very sensible people and justify everything you do in terms of absolutely conventional, naive first order logic before you can get permission to do anything essentially limits businesses to experimenting in a very, very small solution space. And one of the problems, and this applies, by the way, to scientific discoveries as much as it does to new business ideas or to uh, counterintuitive solutions to problems. There are several things going on here, one of which is ultimately, um, uh, you know, Logic and the direct use of logic probably minimizes the disastrous failure space. But the invisible price you pay for demanding logic in every single step of every decision you take is that the possible solution space shrinks to a very, very tiny space, which is generally a space where lots of other people have tried a, a, a solution already. Uh, one of the comments I make in the book is, uh, Basically, if there were a logical solution to your problem, someone would have already found it. Because there isn't really a shortage of logical people in organizations trying to do the logical thing. So the fact that your problem is still a problem may suggest that the solution to it, if found, isn't to be discovered by deploying this 
conventional, sequential, logical approach. Because there are basically more great ideas that you can post-rationalize than there are great ideas you can pre-rationalize. You know, most discoveries in science, actually, penicillin being the most famous, aspirin being another, uh, lots and lots of discoveries in science are actually made accidentally where you discover that they work and you only work out why much later. And if you're not allowed to engage in this process, um, then the number of interesting solutions you can find to a problem uh, is massively limited. And so that's that's a real issue, which is that if we demand, uh, one of the arguments I was making in the advertising industry, which is of relevance to you at Westco, is I think the creative department should work in parallel with the advertising process. In other words, once a problem comes in, you should have creative people working on it at the same time as, say, strategists or planners. And my argument is that genuinely, um, if you if you start deploying lots and lots of logical thought to the process to narrow it down to a single thing, um, you may actually be completely missing out on something seemingly trivial or irrelevant, which a creative person would notice, which might actually be capable of solving the problem. Now, that would involve a bit of post rationalization. But let's be honest, that's how the advertising process works half the time. Someone notices that meerkat sounds a bit like market. OK, and then essentially on that insane leap, you then effectively build the scaffolding to support it um, afterwards. Funnily yeah. enough, I was talking to the person from that agency only yesterday, and he said it all came about because they had a problem with their name, Compare the Market, which is every time somebody searched for Compare, they were in a bidding war on Google with Go Compare. So Google was making more money out of them than they were. And they said, we want people to search for market rather than compare. And the agency, VCCP, said, what we think you should do is you should change your name because you've got a name that competes directly with Compare the Market, which is a disaster from search engine possibilities, and you need to call yourself something stranger and more memorable and more distinctive. And the client, Compare the Market, said, no, we will not change our name. We refuse. The chief executive said, we're not changing our name. So the one part of the brief they had faced was, you cannot change your name. Now, Interestingly, of course, the creative solution is they didn't change their name, but they created an imaginary entity called Compare the Meerkat, which was getting grumpy that it kept getting people searching for um, cheaper car insurance rather than uh, trying to compare meerkats, you see. So what they did is they changed the name without changing the name. And it's a classic creative approach, which is most people go, now we've got to stick with the name. But actually, this was what you might call, to borrow a Tony Blair phrase, it was the third way, which is we don't change the name officially, but we create a new entity, which we talk about a lot, which does have a different name, in order for the halo effect then to drive fame to the company whose name hasn't changed. Now, what I mean by that is if you don't have creative people in at the beginning, a solution like that will never happen. Yeah. And the second problem, which I'll add to, which is a, a problem particularly prone, um, I think, in the public sector and in governmental organisations, is also an order effect, which is that you try... Now, Richard Thaler, who, the author of Nudge, uh, wrote in the New York Times, he said, my experience of Washington is that Washington is, D.C., is essentially run by lawyers who occasionally take advice from economists. Anybody else interested in helping the lawyers out need not apply. And what I think you, what does happen in government is a very strange thing because it's dominated by lawyers and economists. When faced with every problem, they will always look at legislation first, economic incentives second, and other forms of persuasion third. So they'll force people to do something. That's the default mode. The second mode is to bribe people to do something. And only the third route considered in extremis is to ask people nicely. And it is genuinely strange because it's mm. a bias that affects government simply because if you've got a legalistic mindset, you will look for legalistic solutions. Mm. To a man mm. with a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. 
Then if the lawyers are a bit stuck, they go and talk to the economists. And in the words of the brilliant expert, I can't remember his name, Sir Christopher something, who is responsible for the UK on climate change. He was a scientist, a physicist who was briefed to look at climate change. He did make the point, he said, when I go and talk to economists, effectively their answer always boils down to bribing people. Mm. You either find them for not doing something or you pay them to do something. Yeah. And so yeah. the third route, which is simply ask nicely. And by the way, as a organization, I'm going to give you a really interesting tip. OK, one of the strangest, most counterintuitive findings in psychology, um, which makes sense in an evolutionary perspective. If you ask people very nicely to do you a favor. Strangely, whether they perform the favor or not, they actually like you more. Now, conventional economics would suggest if British Airways wrote to me and said, would you be OK going on the 12 o'clock flight rather than the 10 o'clock flight? Because the 10 o'clock flight's overbooked, but the 12 o'clock flight's half empty. OK, and it would really help us out. If you don't really help us out, if you move your seat to 12 o'clock, would that be OK? Um, strangely, if you then go along with that, your natural predisposition towards British Airways is not those bastards owe me, which an economist would assume, for some strange reason, you actually like them slightly more. So one of the things that government does far too little of is, and I wrote about this in The Spectator, about the death of the public information film mm. and the death of Tufty <laughs> and the death of the Green Cross Code Man <coughs> and the death of, uh, you know, handy tips for how to drive in a good way. You know, those kind of things. OK, um, I think... Government doesn't spend nearly enough time just asking people. Mm. Yeah. It assumes that people are entirely self-interested bastards who are only motivated by their own self-enrichment. Mm. It therefore tries to incentivize behavior with economic incentives, which in, is always in danger of crowding out pro-social behavior. Yeah. Because if you teach people they should be paid to do a decent thing, mm. They don't learn to do it. I was I was in an economic conference, but it was a strange thing. It was actually part of the Hay Festival. And a kid found my mobile phone and he brought it back with his father, who's a behavioral economist. And I said, oh, look, look I, oh, he is very good of him to find this mobile phone. He was only 10 or whatever. And he brought it back. And I said, well, I should give him a fiver. And the father said, no, no, don't give him a fiver. If you start paying him for doing the decent thing, the next thing you know is he'll be demanding payment to, you know, do the washing up or tidy his bedroom. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things economists probably do is they also create the kind of behaviour that is present in their models, yeah. which is broadly speaking, you know, psychopathic. Yeah. So so you'd be pleased to hear that kind of Westco actually does have the creatives right at the beginning of Perfect, all of our yeah, problems. We do kind right, of, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's, and it really works uh, uh, like that. But can you so you kind of got the main uh, tenet of the uh, of the of the book. Can you, can you say a little bit about how we've come to that position through evolutionary biology and kind of you know, how the brain develops and stuff? I mean, there's a reason why people prefer to pretend that logic makes every decision, isn't there? Yeah, I mean. Uh, to be honest, consume, if you want to put it very bluntly, consumer decision making, if there's a simple heuristic at work, it's minimization of regret. In other words, when we've got a complicated decision to make, and arguably the world is getting more complicated, so our need for heuristics has actually gone up. You know, it used to be in, you know, it, it, you know, 18th century consumer decisions were how much does it cost? What does it taste like? Is it safe? You know, they were fairly simple. If you're buying a piece of consumer electronics now, there are so many variables that what you might do is go on YouTube and watch an expert and see what he recommended, which is a perfectly reasonable heuristic, you know, um, copying other people. Habit and uh, social copying a reasonable heuristics for the avoidance of catastrophe. You know, if you buy the best selling car in Britain, it may not be your perfect car, but you can be fairly confident it's not a crock of shit either, you know, okay? Um, you know, if you buy things you've bought 10 times before and they've always been okay, that again is the, you know, the minimizing of the risk of regret. Now in institutional decision-making, which is why actually, you know, um, uh, there's a, there's a kind of behavioral economics case for Brexit. I won't get into that, but it's nonetheless interesting. In institutional decision making, if you look at it, what people are trying to minimize is the risk of blame. So 
if you've been tasked with solving a problem, one, you want to make it very visible that you're trying to solve the problem, which probably means you'll do something that directly tackles the problem rather than something that tackles it creatively or obliquely from one side. So you'll look for a first order solution, not a kind of second order solution. That's the first issue. The second thing is, is that um, you'll, you'll, there's a wonderful quote from John Maynard Keynes where he says, worldly wisdom teaches it is often better for the reputation to fail conventionally than to succeed unconventionally. Now, if you think about it like this, okay, if you do a completely logical solution to the problem and it doesn't work, it doesn't matter because you won't lose your job, okay? You don't, you know, if, I mean, most, I think, a large part of information gathering and presentation in business is actually um, what you might call um, rigor it's actually arse covering disguised as rigor. And you're really doing all that stuff and getting in McKinsey and producing a 200 page deck, not because it's going to change the fundamental nature of the decision you're planning to take, but to defend yourself in the event that things go wrong. You know, and so, you know, in enormous, I mean, I, I, um, I'm Gerd Gigerenz at the Max Planck Institute. Um, I chatted to him on stage and we more or less said, look, if it weren't for this need to signal um, uh, the, uh, to, to, uh, it's called defensive decision making. If it weren't for defensive decision making, we could all really go home on Wednesday afternoon. You know, we, 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 we could work a two and a half day week and still accomplish as much. But the need to defend your decision, because if you think about it, if things go well, and you're employed in a public sector role or even most private sector roles, okay, if things go well, you'll just get to share a bit of credit. You know, it's fine, okay. If things go brilliantly well, yeah, you'll get a bit more credit. You might, you know. But if you do an imaginative solution which goes wrong, you lose your job. So the downside consequences for an eccentric or imaginative solution in terms of risk of blame are very, very different. And there's a massive asymmetry there, because if you're conventionally logical and things don't work, the amount of blame you receive is minimal. What could you have done? You were so logical about this. OK, it's not your fault. The second you diverge from conventional thinking and do something a bit lateral or oblique, OK, um, in the event that you succeed, it's not like anybody will shower you with cash. OK, right. Not true if you're an entrepreneur. You see, the entrepreneur enjoys the full fruits of the upside gain for the eccentric or experimental decision. But in any institutional role, it's not like anybody will come along and say, oh, well, that was very good. Here's a hundred thousand pounds. OK. On the other hand, there are virtually no ways in which my I worked out the other day. I was talking about this. There is nothing I could do which would get my employer to give me a million dollars. But there are hundreds of things I could do which could lose my job. So as a result, business decision making becomes hyper cautious hyper defensive and therefore hyper rational yeah and i think i think that's you know for, for political organizations like councils and, uh, and governments and like such i'm sure that is a, a big part mm. of the issue is d defensive decision making um i was going to ask you i mean it's your example of booking a flight from city airport isn't it it's yes oh yeah that, uh, thank you for prompting me yeah the, it, it's what i call the heathrow effect which I live in Kent. I was traveling to New York. The Ogilvy office in New York is much, much closer to Newark than it is to JFK. But every time I had to go to New York once or twice a year, I'd always go, could I have some flights to New York, please? And they'd always come back with a list of British Airways flights from Heathrow to JFK. And I'd go, yeah, um, you haven't really thought this through, have you? Because one, I might like to fly from London City, which is a really convenient flight, which is much closer to me. Or I might want to fly into Newark. And I thought, why is this going on? Why are they all defaulting to Heathrow, JFK? And I realized, of course, because it's the norm, if you're a PA, if you're an underling, if you're a travel agent, if you go with the norm, if anything goes wrong, your boss will blame British Airways, okay? Because you didn't really take a decision at all. You just went Heathrow, JFK, like everybody else. Nobody thought about it, went with the flow, no blame. Now, it might be better for me to fly from Newark, or it might be better for me to fly from London City, the other end, okay? Now, if you book your boss on a flight from JFK, from Newark or from London City, if anything goes wrong, he might blame you, not British Airways. If you hadn't booked me from this goddamn Toy Town Airport, I'd be in New York by now, okay? So there's a huge 
reluctance to take a decision which is a noticeable decision or deviation from expected norm because of the very, very different blame equation. Now, I, I argue that's why there are four big audit and accounting firms. OK, if you appoint Pricewaterhouse, if anything goes wrong, everybody blames Pricewaterhouse. If you say, no, we're not going to go with the big four. I've discovered this boutique firm in um, Leamington Spa that can do it for us twice as quickly and at half the price. OK, it's probably a better decision. But if anything goes wrong, instead of people going, God, isn't it extraordinary that Price Waterhouse made that cock up? If anything goes wrong, it's now your fault for not appointing one of the big four. So you're out on your ear. So the disincentives in career terms, if you think about the asymmetry of that, the upside of a good decision is someone goes, yeah, that was quite a good idea, Rory. OK, you know, it's not like anybody showers you with cash or says you now have job security for five years on the strength of your flight of genius. OK, the credit dissipates and the gains dissipate to the shareholders almost immediately, whereas the loss, the losses are actually internalized. And, you know, uh, you know, and we have too little job security, by the way. We started off in the 1970s. There was too much. You can also have too little job security because everybody simply plays it safe and tries to make it what, what you might call invisible non-decisions as often as you possibly can. And I, I do find that he, what I call the J, you know, the JFK effect, yeah. really. I mean, fun enough, Newark's actually. If you're, anybody is flying to New York in the next couple of years, Newark, to be honest, is probably a better airport. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, as we, we'll go into a bit of how you can create environments in which um, you can have, you know, the irrational as well as the reason, and, and and come up with those ideas. But I just want to step back a little bit into. Um, you know, the development of the brain and evolutionary biology, why we're geared the way we are. Can you say a little bit about a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah, so Jonathan Haidt's very good on this and nobody quite knows who said it or where it comes from. And it's sometimes attributed to me, but I'm fairly sure it wasn't me. And I attribute it to Jonathan Haidt, who isn't sure that it's him. This is Jonathan Haidt, the author of The Righteous Mind, which is um, the conscious part of the human brain thinks it's the Oval Office, but in reality, it's more like the press office. It thinks it's making decisions and issuing edicts. In reality, what it's doing is mostly cobbling together hasty post-rationalized explanations for decisions taken elsewhere for reasons it doesn't fully understand. And we kind of have the mind of a lawyer, not the mind of a scientist, which is we look for an explanation for something, partly just to defend our actions, and once we found that explanation, we don't look any deeper. And so uh, it's the example I always give in my book is toothpaste. You know, why do you clean your teeth to mean maintain dental health? OK, you know, to avoid fillings and tooth decay and to maintain the health of my gums, because that's the official formal reason. And we stop at that. And we don't ask any deeper. Now, if you look at when people clean their teeth, what you'll see and the fact that 90 percent of the world's toothpaste, 99 percent of the world's toothpaste is flavored with mint, which is a substance a lot of people don't really like the taste of very much. OK, <clears throat> you quickly realize that the deep primal motivation for cleaning your teeth is vanity and fear of bad breath and fear of social stigma. You know, you clean your teeth before a date. You know, you clean your teeth before sex, or in, you know, if the relationship's relatively you know, new. Um, and, um, uh, you know, you clean your teeth before you go to work. Do you clean your teeth after lunch? Most people don't bother, you see. So when you look at it, what you realize is going on is that the unconscious motivation, it does not align perfectly with the official explanation. And that's because once we found a plausible explanation, like a lawyer, like a defense lawyer, we go, here's your alibi. That's what I'm going to use. Boom. Now, whether it's true or not doesn't really matter because we've evolved the conscious reasoning function in humans for reasons of social arguing. It, it's for argument purposes, not for decision making purposes. So our faculty of reason has really been evolved with the mindset of a defense lawyer, not with a mindset of deep inquiry. Yeah. And so economic, I'll give you a lovely example of this, OK, which is um, economics. If you look at the price mechanism in economics, you have the price demand curve. And when you drop the price of something, um, the number of people who can actually improve their utility by making the purchase is increased by the reduction in price. OK, and so the theory is when you drop the price of something, uh, essentially, um, 
uh, more people buy it because people who weren't prepared to buy it at the old price will now buy it at the new price. That's how it essentially works in economics, the whole price mechanism, which is fundamental to microeconomics. If you look at how it's used in business, it's nothing like that at all, okay? Most of the time, first of all, um, you know, if you have 50% extra free oven chips, you put a great big flash on the packet to advertise the fact. Um, most people will buy it because it's on deal, so it makes the decision easier. Very frequently in marketing, you drop the price to get people who would have paid the full price to buy it sooner to overcome their inertia. OK, so the, you know, if you look at it, shops don't drop their sales all the time. They hold a sale to create a behaviour that wouldn't take place if you didn't make a lot of noise about dropping your prices. So um, economics, so, so the price mechanism and price reduction in marketing, I would argue, works in a completely different way to the way in which economists assume that the price mechanism works. It's largely done to overcome inertia and to mm. make a decision easier. It isn't really done because you go, I wouldn't have paid 90 pounds for that, but since it's 80, yeah. 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 No, it's re really interesting. They're kind of you know, making that decision yeah. instinctively and then post rationalizing with a kind of. And, and typically, logical of part course, of if the explanation is highly rational, we favor it because oh, yeah. as, a de as a defense case in an institutional setting, it, it, it stands up much better. Yeah. Um, and it, and I that's think why, said, by the way, fervent Remainers who weren't yeah. remotely interested in trade economics six months before suddenly started going, blah, 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 3% fall in GDP caused by friction from blah, blah. And you, you sort of go, hold on, you people weren't interested in this area of political activity yeah. at all. Zilch, zero, until it suited your Remainer disposition to contrive yeah. a lot of... Um, it's one of, the, uh, one of the reasons why the Remainer argument, I think, didn't really land because it sounded essentially um, insincere, that you were just scrabbling together to find uh, economic figures that supported your case, even though you'd showed no previous interest in this you know, yeah. campaigning for trade barriers to be reduced. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you, I think you said uh, earlier on that this, you know, this isn't something new. Um, and I, was, I was thinking about David Hume and the Treaties of Human Nature. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, you know, that reason ought to be the slave, the of, slave passions. of the passions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's and it's it's true, isn't it? But it, it's sometimes... uh, there's a wonderful book on this, uh, Ian yeah. McGilchrist's book, "The Master and His Emissary," where he argues that the modern world has disproportionately and and decision making processes have lent too much power to the left brain. Yeah. Where if you look at most organizations, they're run by the finance department, really, aren't they? Let's be honest, okay? Because the finance department, who are deeply risk averse, who know they can be blamed for a cost, but they can never be blamed for a missed opportunity, okay? What would have happened in the old days is somebody would have said, um, our, our, our specification calls for this kind of cladding, okay? Now, someone, one of the suppliers in the old days would have said, uh, to be absolutely honest, mate, I don't think that's great from a fire safety point of view. I think you need to go one or two up. Now, that, that person's motivation, by the way, might have been that they wanted to make more money, okay, by selling more expensive cladding. Doesn't matter what the motivation was. But one person would have gone back, a, a trusted supplier would have gone back and said, to be absolutely honest, you, you need something else. But now you have a procurement system, which is for the need for completely fair comparison means you cannot question the brief. We've noticed this in advertising. If you go back and say, look, you're proposing to spend five million pounds on advertising to solve this problem. We don't think you need to do this. You can actually do this by changing the design of the product. If we went back to that, we would never get the business. So one of the things procurement has done is it prevents supplier expertise filtering back up the funnel. OK. And so I think procure, I think the power of the finance department is deeply dangerous because here you have a group of people who, who are, are highly attuned to cost, but are totally unattuned to missed opportunity for which they never get blamed because it never appears in their figures. Mm. Yeah, no, interesting. And I, I think I think this Ian McGilchrist point that the world, the, that more data has actually disempowered some of the evolutionary instincts present in the right hemisphere to use... McGilchrist's, mm. uh, he believes it's actually in neuroscience. I believe, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think it matters whether this is neuroscientifically true. I think that what you might call is the brain has two modes of thinking and we've come to disproportionately prefer one over the other. 
And, you know, there are certain decisions you can't take with a spreadsheet because the things that people care about don't have numerical metrics attached. If you look at waiting time in public trans transit, public transport, OK, what people care about isn't duration. It's the degree of uncertainty. Transport for London finds it impossible to get funding for those bus timetables. I think they're absolutely decisive. OK, the fact that you know when your next bus is coming is a major factor in encouraging you to take the bus. OK, uh, they can't get funding because the only models of investment that London Transport uh, allow have to reduce travel time or overcrowding or one of a series of what you might call physical metrics. They're not allowed to spend money against psychology. But actually, what people would rather wait 12 minutes for a tube with a dot matrix display saying next tube edgeware 12 minutes. People are much happier doing that than they are waiting five minutes for a tube train in a state of uncertainty. Yeah, it's like airport security queues, isn't it? Another one of oh, your yeah. examples. Oh, no, no. There are loads of things you can do there, by the way. If you can keep mm. it. Uh, do, do you want to know the whole psychology? And, and by the way, call centres are another really fascinating area where... Um, I, I, very, very simple tip, and I, nobody can do this because the metrics don't work, and I've been asking someone to test it for ages. I think if you offer to call people back, okay, if you have a mechanism that says, if you'd prefer not to wait on the phone, press one, and we can call you back within the next 30 minutes, okay, and then you do call back, okay, particularly if you call them back within five minutes, because that's better than they expected, so they're now actually delighted, okay, I think the whole nature of the phone call is different because the fact that they call you makes you feel less like a supplicant and more like a customer. And my contention is if you wanted to cross sell things, if you wanted people to get less angry about bad customer service, if you want, I think the offer to call people back would be absolutely decisive in terms of changing the psychological component of the call. Mm. But all the metrics around call centres are around things like how quickly you answer the call and how yeah. long they take. Yeah, well, that is something maybe we should suggest. I mean, it's easy mm. to test, isn't it? We could, you could test that. In oh, oh, I'd absolutely love that. Yeah. 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 There are certain things you can do. I mean, what was something I said the other day? I mean, the police, lovely case. I, we do a lot of work with the police and I'm in sort of... You know, I could, I, I, you're, you're all watching Line of Duty, right? I'm a bit of a kind of amateur wannabe cop. You know, I've, there are a few things I find very similar to the creative process, cryptic crosswords, uh, police detective work, all involve this thing which Conan Doyle called reverse reasoning. You know, in other words, it's reasoning backwards. And we, we're very, very good at reasoning forwards. If this happens, what will happen next? What we don't develop the skill for is this has happened or we need this to happen. What could the prior conditions be that would cause this to happen? OK, and so those those things which involve kind of perverse reasoning, I think, always interest me. But one of the things I said with the cops is about, you know, your car's broken into. Right. And the cops say, I'm afraid we can't investigate this. And everybody's really pissed off. And I didn't say to the cops, they don't want you to solve your crime specifically. They don't care whether the people are brought to trial for the theft from your car. But they want the bastards banged to rights, right? You know, basic human vengeance urge. Now, I said, if someone's got their car broken into or their garden shed broken into and you can't really investigate and there wasn't any CTTV and so on and so forth, you can then say, we think this is part of something and you can keep them informed when you next arrest a, you know, a car theft gang operating in the area and you let the people who are victims of this group know that you've caught them and that they're being brought to trial in four months' time, OK? That person now feels the cops are doing their job. Because you've caught, it may not be the same person, but if you say there's a reasonable probability that, you know, these may be the people who broke into your shed, okay, and we've now arrested them, the cop is looking at it from the mentality of, did I solve this person's crime? The consumer, and it's a fa fantastic book on this, by the way, institutions always see the world from a very different lens from, than their customers. And government sees the world through a very, very strange dehumanized lens, which typically consists of aggregate data with a lot of 
more complicated data missed out. Now, if there are any keen anarchists among you, it would be very interesting if, if, if rather like Ron Swanson, there were anarchists working at Westminster Council um, or extreme libertarians. There's a book by a guy called James C. Scott, who's an anarchist anthropologist, and it's called Seeing Like a State. And it makes the point that the way in which government looks at the economy and human existence from the top down with aggregated information generally presented in averaged form doesn't capture anything like the nuance of everyday lived human existence. OK, so a, a very interesting fact, and, and he makes the point that this goes back a thousand years. The Doomsday Book includes cattle and buildings and land, but it doesn't mention people. <laughs> it's a really fascinating thing. The actual population are considered to be irrelevant. It's a town with yeah. so many cows and this many buildings. Yeah. <coughs> Brilliant. So look, before we just get into kind of like how, how do we create an environment in which we can um, uh, look, look at this in organisations like um, councils. Hmm. Um, and so what we're saying, but we, what we're not saying is, you know, do away and abandon reason. What we're saying is understand how decisions are made and bring that into the process of designing better solutions and, and communicating uh, be better to people. So I just wanted to finish off this this little bit with just a few quick fire examples so we can really show people from, from your book uh, about what that can De develop in terms of ideas as so, uh, often a bridesmaid and listerine i never knew that before i read your book you tell there, there was a that? song uh why am i always the bridesmaid but what popularized it in english was um essentially this was listerine uh, uh, nearly all hygiene products in the 1920s 30s in the victorian age were basically sold on a darwinian premise which is if you don't wash with our soap you will mm -hmm. die single and alone okay and, uh, you know, if there was a massive fear of regret in the 19th century, it was, uh, you know, the fear of being single beyond a certain age was probably an absolute paranoia, which the advertising industry played on. But it was very dominant. It didn't say, with the exception of Lifebuoy, which was always a hygiene brand, most of the other Unilever brands or the P&G brands effectively did not say, wash with this soap and help prevent a cholera outbreak. OK, they got people to do it for a selfish reason. And then the pro-social benefit of greater hygiene emerged as a consequence of that. Now, that has important consequences, I think, in things like the environmental movement, which is, let's be honest, what we're going to do, OK, is that we often... Conventional logic says that we form our opinions and then our behaviour takes shape to align with our opinions. It, it works just as often the other way around, that we adopt a behaviour and then we backform our opinions to make sense of our behavior and so with electric cars this will happen to me in the next year i will buy an electric car basically because it's cool okay i'm you know i have to confess that you know not to 60 and four point whatever it is nine second 4.5 seconds um to be honest some of the nerdiness like the trouble about ch traveling and the hassle deep down i think actually appeals to me because it allows you to brag about it yeah, well, fortunately, we managed to find a Chadamo at Lee Delamere, so um, it only took us half an hour to get back to 80%. Right, I mean, come on, OK? Um, uh, don't one of you do it. There's a guy called James Hoffman on YouTube who's the world champion barista who talks to you about how to make perfect coffee. And it's, you know, humans have a natural... If you get into this guy's videos, James Hoffman on YouTube, OK, you'll you'll go in as a totally sane middle aged person. OK, as I did. And like three hours later, you're ordering your coffee filters from Japan and thinking of spending 500 pounds on a burr grinder that's handmade by Lithuanian nuns. OK, but, you know, there are a lot of things that humans get into. It's particularly male, I think, where I'm sorry, I'm just going to answer the door. Christine. Oh, are you OK to answer the door? Sorry about that. Sorry about this. Um, where, to be honest, it's the bragging rights and the obsession and the weird nerdishness around it that's as much the motivation. But I'll buy the electric car. And because I've got an electric car, um, I will then start teasing my friends who have petrol cars about all the harm they're doing to the environment. Right. OK, it's not part of my motivation, but I'm going to go, well, of course, why don't you just drive over and pollute the environment in your hideous uh, internal combustion engine car? And then we can go and have a pint. You know, if I can still breathe. OK, now I'm going to do that. And then my behaviour is increasingly going to be formed by the opinion, which was really formed by a behaviour in the first place. So there's this kind of continuous loop. And so 
don't always try and argue. Just make the behavior easy, attractive, social and timely, to borrow the model from the behavioral insights team. Make the behavior easy to adopt. People will adopt the behavior. And then having adopted the behavior, their opinions will actually catch up. Yeah. As, you know, we, I mean, we did a campaign in London for RAP, which is a food waste charity and a recycling charity. And the whole point we made, the whole campaign was one bin is rubbish. We said, look, actually, it's pointless talking about polar bears and, you know, the melting ice caps when people only have one bin. Because let's be honest. Right. OK. If you put Jeremy Clarkson in a villa with two bins, he'll probably separate the rubbish out. Right. If you put jo no, probably unfair to George Monbiot, <laughs> but if you put George Monbiot in a you know living under house arrest for two weeks in a place with only one bin, um, you know after about day ten he's going to look at this thing. Oh fuck it, you know, boom. Okay, and so the environment you know, has a major effect. You know, people people who aren't particularly environmentally assiduous will recycle actually when you provide them with the mechanism to do so. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I'd like to look at other things. If you look at solar power, what we've looked at, the economists have all said we've got considerable incentives for solar power, okay? I've looked at it and said, what you need here, mate, isn't financial incentives for converting my house to yeah. solar. What you need here, mate, in order to make it easy, attractive, social and timely, is you need me to have a halfway house. I've got loads of hue bulbs in the house. I didn't buy them all at once, right? I bought two and I thought, well, this is actually quite good. And then I bought three more. Now, if you can find a scalable home solar solution where you can start small and then invest more as it starts to work, or you have a solar device which just charges your electric car, okay? I'm not going to, look at that fear of regret thing, fear of regret, fear of blame, fear of humiliation. It's called Minimax, actually. It's called, it's a heuristic strategy where you choose the option which has the least bad worst case scenario, okay? Now, uh, if you look at my uh, propensity to adopt solar power, there is a 1% chance, it's like moving bank. The reason nobody ever moves their bank is because there's a 3% chance it's total catastrophe, right? Now, uh, <clears throat> here's the interesting thing, okay? If I actually move, um, uh, if I move to a totally solar powered home, if you're asking me to spend 30,000 pounds on something which has a small chance of being a total disaster, you know, just not working or destroying my roof, I don't know, or blowing off in a hurricane or something like that, right? I'm just not gonna take that risk. You can give me all the economic incentives you want. I'm not gonna do it too much as in one decision okay now i'll give you a very simple example which is where things are very strange i was talking to samsung and they said how do we get people off ios into the uh i'll give them a bit of a plug that you know the samsung galaxy s21 ultra which is arguably a better phone i said you'll never do it i said there's only one way you can do it you give them a samsung phone to try out for three weeks alongside their ios phone uh, and if you could have two SIMs so that the actual thing worked in both or duplicate SIMs, I don't know if that's even possible, okay? You might just about get people to admit that the Samsung's better. But asking someone to give up their existing phone before they take on the Samsung, it's never going to happen, mm. okay? You need to find a period of parallel running. I'd say that's the electoral... Car no, I'll, I'll give you a lovely case of, of the incentive of getting it wrong, right? Of seeing like a state. This is what I mean by seeing like a state, okay? So I, I was I decided my next car is going to be an electric car, and I think I might even have three phase power the house here. Weirdly, so I got in touch with one of these people, and I said, "Can you install a charging point? Because we, we, you know, there are seven of us who share a house. I don't mean like a flat share; it's a big house converted into apartments. I didn't want you to think I'm kind of crashing on some of the sofa." Um, and um, uh, I said, um, "Can you install a few charging points for both our guests and because all of us are planning to buy electric cars?" And they said, um, yeah, in fact, you get a subsidy. It's a brilliant idea. But you get a subsidy if you install those charging points. It's a £300 government subsidy. I said, brilliant. OK, so uh, let's go and install one. They said, ah, to get the subsidy, you have to prove you own an electric car. And I said, but I want to install the charging point. I'm not going to buy an electric car, which is a five-figure purchase, only to discover I've got to spend the next three years with a cable coming out of my bathroom window. I want to install the chart. Now, 
What government got wrong there is all you've got to do is incentivize people to install electric car chargers at home and their next car is going to be electric anyway. Because if I've spent £200 getting an electric charging point for my home, I'm going to feel a bit of a dick if I go and buy a diesel, aren't I? Right. So this is what I mean. If you can get people to take the first step, the second step is much, much easier. Yeah. But ec economists don't understand this, you see, because psychology is exogenous to their whole model. Um, time actually is exogenous to the model. They they view optimal economic outcomes as just a series of individual optimized decisions taken over time. But what's rational in a one shot decision isn't rational in a series of behaviors. Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 so we've kind of mentioned a few things about how you can bring this into your thinking and, and designing sol solutions mm. for services. Defensive decision making, something we've mentioned. Mini Max, I think, is a, a absolutely right. Um, We've also talked a little bit about um, defining the problem in the right way. And I, I, lo I loved it in your book about kind of just ask the right questions at the right time. You know, why yeah. do people book a GP <coughs> appointment? Why don't people recycle and really think about it through the prism of, um, of, of psychology? No, and certainly looking at the negative, one criticism I'll make of marketing, and I include that, you know, I include myself in that group is we disproportionately, I think, because it comes from the FMCG era, where the product we assumed was on the shelves, okay? And therefore, the way to get people to buy it was to say, it's great, okay? And we spent far too much time emphasizing the positives rather than exploding the negatives. And the obstacles to behavior are, are more likely to be loss aversion or some negative fear you know, I mean, I, you know, the case for the case for solar power is actually pretty strong because the technology is now so efficient, even in the UK. You know, if you've got a reasonably large garden, it probably wouldn't make sense if you're planning to stay. Then there are a whole lot of issues about, you know, how long am I going to stay in the house? OK, um, the most interesting idea I've seen in, in clean energy, by the way, is on YouTube. And it's a guy who rigged it up at his own expense as a kind of amateur electrical engineer. And it's a solar trailer, okay? It's a trailer that has solar panels on it. It's on wheels, right? And it's got an inverter. And if you leave this solar trailer plugged into your Tesla for sort of three days without driving anywhere, it basically charges the Tesla through solar power. And I'm going, there are a lot of times where I don't drive anywhere for a couple of days. And of course, with the new working patterns, there are going to be more. Secondly, if I buy this solar trailer and it just doesn't work for me, I can sell it to somebody else and they can come and take it away. OK, there are a whole lot of things with, with this trailer which strike me as incredibly clever, which the guy who invented it hasn't noticed, you know. And secondly, you know, I can move it. You know, if I go, if my wife says, I mean, you know, the permanence of the solar power installation is partly what frightens us. But then, of course, what you might do is you might get the solar trailer with a bit of a battery and I go into work. The solar trailer is powering the battery. I come home, plug the battery in. Now we're getting somewhere. OK. Now, OK, I haven't solar powered my home yet, but then I'm, I'm on the way, if mm. you see what I mean. I'm, 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 I'm starting on the journey. And it's a very simple psychological insight that people don't like making massive commitments in one go. Yeah. You know, huge, huge commitments, irreversible commitments. Yeah. Okay? Frighten people. Yeah. Okay? yeah. Small, gradual, let's try a couple of few bulbs and see how I get on. Now, if, if, the, you know, if the electrician had come to me and said, I think you should spend £900 converting your home to Philips Hue, I would piss off, right? <laughs> okay, you get there in steps. But again, most of the models in economic and legal terms are completely mm. blind to this. And yeah. there are a lot of problems, by the way, you can't solve by compulsion or by economic incentive. Mm. You can only solve by persuasion. Yeah. And a, a, a kind of a previous discussion of ours, is, you know, co-designing those solutions with the people that you want to do. Because behavioural economics is too confined to communications at the moment. I think the BIT has been too confined to how you communicate things. And really to deliver its full value, behavioural economics has to be in at the start, which is how you design the programme in the first place. I went to the Treasury, yeah. OK, and I said, you made a terrible mistake here because you've increased the ISA allowance from £3,000 a year to £20,000. And they go, how can that be a mistake? It's encouraging saving. I said, it isn't because the scarcity effect's been lost. When I could only put £3,000 into an ISA every year, I thought, I'd better put something in this year, because otherwise I've missed the window, right? Now, to be honest, if you and your wife and your two kids can all afford to save £20,000 
after tax every year, right? You don't really need help from the bloody government, do you? The last thing you need is a tax break. You're loaded, right? <laughs> okay. When you made it £20,000, my impetus to put money into the ISA every year had gone because I thought, oh, well, I can just wait till I get a windfall and put £10,000 in three years hence. OK. And one of the people at the Treasury went, that's weird, because when they put the limit up, I stopped saving my ISA and it never occurred to me why I was doing that. Mm. And so they did something which, in, in the lights of economic theory, is a perfectly rational thing to do, encourage saving by increasing the amount people can... Um, can can put in, okay. Yeah. And, and don't don't get me started on pensions, which have a mechanism which makes them, you know, de deliberately discouraging to the young. Mm. You need to have, someone needs to design a legal pension where you get a tax break, but where the, a certain amount of the money is retrievable. Yeah, I wonder what that could be. Great okay. to go back to the Treasury and have a look at those figures actually, and see uh, see see what's happened. Um, anyway, I I probably time to bring in some questions, Rory, if that's all right. Is that yeah. Here's something I do. I do a pension which says, OK, this is a weird thing because it's a loan combined with a pension. And if you're 25, if you commit to pay this amount per month, all the money goes into the pension, but it also comes with a £5,000 line of credit. So if you need money in the short term, you can draw down on it. Right. Now. I think that would actually appeal to 25 year olds as a form of saving because it's Benefit now in the sh you can't ask 25 year olds to stay to think of their 60 year old self. It's absurd. OK, you know, I mean, and saying uh, we think you're 25 and we think the best use of your money, OK, is to actually is to save for retirement when they have no idea what's going to happen over the future. Now, we we know that having access to three thousand pounds worth of money at short notice makes a major difference to people's welfare and to their level of kind of economic expenditure and intelligence. You know, we need to redesign products this way. I would have taken up that product. I would have basically said, OK, I get mm. the deal. I pay X hundred pounds a month. But um, there's, you know, there's three thousand pounds here now, which I'm going to try not to touch. Mm. But by paying in this two hundred pounds, I know I'm not going to find myself skint. Mm. Okay, you could you could create that hybrid product in an afternoon with a financial yeah. services company. Yeah, a bit like having a hybrid product for buying houses or having a share in a house. I mean, you know, the housing market is something that could possibly benefit from. Oh yeah, like don't, don't get me started on that. I mean, that's a really interesting one, which is I think we've had a problem in London, which is conventional economic logic suggests that rising house, house prices will cause people to move out of London, because that's what economic logic would suggest, you know, the arbitrage opportunity of moving from a sort of two bedroom, you know, garden flat in Fulham to a six bedroom rectory in East Kent, you'd think would become irresistible. I think it's very weird because people know that you can only leverage yourself to this extent in the property market. You can't leverage yourself in any other market this way. So your chance of a once in a lifetime windfall is basically dependent on your house. And therefore people were reluctant to leave London, one for missing out on future gains, which is regret, okay? And the second reason they're reluctant to leave London is they felt that with rising house prices in London, the second they moved out, they could never move back again. And so I actually think that oddly, when London house prices stabilise and possibly even fall, you'll start to see an exodus from London much, much faster than you did when they were going up. Because, again, conventional economic logic doesn't apply across the board with certain <laughs> things like your house. There are all sorts of psychological things going on, um, uh, which are you know really, really strange. Yeah. Yeah. No, agree. Do you mind if we start asking and bringing in some questions? Absolutely from the delighted. Chat, Rory. Delighted. Great. Yeah, Martha, can I can I ask you to pick a couple of questions and uh, um, let's put them to Rory? Absolutely. Um, so we've got one from Cash, which is he'd love to hear your opinion on vaccination uptake. I.e., can people be persuaded to get their vaccine, or is a legalistic approach needed, or maybe a hybrid approach? Uh, really interesting. <coughs> um, <coughs> from a libertarian standpoint, by the way. Um, I was talking to Deirdre McCloskey, the economist, about this. I don't have an objection to airlines de demanding passports of people. They're a private airline. They can take who they want. And they can say it's discouraging to um, other 
uh, our other customers if they feel they're going to be in the presence of unvaccinated people. And therefore, you don't have a right to board British Airways. It gets complicated. Interestingly, is a majority of the US Marines have declined the vaccine. And whether that's machismo, interestingly, the US Army can't demand it of them because it's a vaccine issued under a kind of uh, a particular, uh, the vaccine's only been approved legally under a particular kind of uh, emergency legislation. Should employers be allowed to demand it of employees? Um, uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Fortunately, in the UK, and we need to ask why this is, generally, the level of anti-vaxxing is quite low compared to other countries. I don't know why that is, by the way, um, entirely. And we need to ask I mean, a little bit of it might be because we kind of invented the things. You know, we have a country with a history of fairly significant medical discoveries. So there may be a slightly sort of nationalistic element to it. Um, but I, I, I don't, you know, but that's only, that's only part of the explanation. I mean, I, you know, it could be, you know, affection for the NHS, which we see as being essentially benign, that we trust it in a way we wouldn't trust a, a, a commercially motivated entity, perhaps. Um, I, you know, I, I generally don't know. Um, I... The answer to that is really interesting because it's different. Now, the, the interesting question is, um, people who object, I mean, as I said, I mean, I lean libertarian, but I didn't understand the anti-masking movement at all. I, I genuinely didn't understand it because it struck me as, you know, I cover my genitals in public, you know, not out of my own sense of comfort, but out of respect to other people, you know, and that other people, even if I think they're wrong, might be alarmed if I go around unmasked. So as a basic courtesy, you obey the social norm and it's a coordination problem. Now, a really interesting question is, if there are 10 people in my office who say we refuse to vaccinate, what do we do? And I don't know. Um, I mean, in some cases, you might say, well, you know, I'm terribly sorry, you'll, you'll just have to work somewhere else or sit here or go somewhere else. Um, but that that business, I mean, I, I think it's perfectly within the rights of a private organisation to demand criteria of people before they give admission. You know, in the same way that, you know, you have to be over 18 to go to a to drink in a pub. I, I, I don't think there's anything controversial about that. Um, uh, you, know, you might argue that it's within their rights to allow admission to people who are uh, not vaccinated if they're skeptics. But this is a huge problem, which basically comes head to head with libertarianism, because I incidentally add a further um, moral obligation here, which is that one of the reasons why you're obliged to obey the rules, okay, is it's only when everybody obeys the rules that we can find out what works and what doesn't. If you get a significant amount of non-compliance, um, you won't even know what parts of your legislation are working. I mean, I think we can confidently say now, this is a really interesting one, okay, and so I'm, I'm ducking this question because I genuinely don't know the answer and I'll need to go and research it more. Um, uh, personally, I think as an employer, uh, I'm slightly wary about forcing people to be vaccinated. But on the other hand, um, uh, I, I don't fully understand the mentality uh, uh, of hostility to it. But here's a really interesting case, OK, where you can't be purely scientific. I'll give you two cases, OK? One, actually, the third group of people we should have vaccinated were not uh, people in their 60s. We should have uh, uh, vaccinated the very vulnerable first, but the third or fourth group should have been the very sociable young because they're more likely to be super spreaders, okay? So it would have made sense from an epidemiological point of view to go out and vaccinate, you know, 22-year-old 20, clubbers in Manchester, okay? That would have actually been the logical thing to do. But you can't ethically say, I'm terribly sorry your grandmother had to die, but there were these three guys in Manchester who wanted to get off their heads on, you know, cat or something. I don't know what you young people do nowadays, a bit out of touch, you know. But, um, but, but, but you can't really say that ethically. In the same way, I think we could confidently say that outdoor transmission was incredibly rare. The problem with outdoor, with outdoor transmission and just allowing outdoor events is that outdoor socialization tends to lead inexorably to indoor socialization. So people host a garden party or a barbecue, it gets cold in the evening, you know, the patio heater runs out of juice. The next thing you know is they move to the conservatory, four people have used the loo, and then three people have started an argument in the kitchen. 
That happened, by the way, if that sounds strange, that happened at the White House. They had an event in the Rose Garden and they move, all moved indoors, which is where Trump, I think, picked it up and a bunch of other people picked it up. And so um, it's very interesting, by the way, that number 10 was a super spreading centre because politicians are obsessively, they're obsessed with, with FOMO, really, aren't they, politicians? So they're absolutely hyper obsessed with presenteeism and being there. The whole thing about politics is not getting left out of the meeting. And so, you know, it was, it was very, very interesting that number 10 was such a, you know, such a major source of transmission. You know, the, the re really, number 10 should have gone into a, you know, given its, 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 its centrality as a nerve centre, the second this thing struck, they should have all actually gone to secure places separated and connected by highly advanced video conferencing software. Mm. Uh, and that was that was the weirdest thing, you know. There isn't even a doctor on call in number ten. Okay, that interested me, because but this is what I say: where there's always a behavioural component, it's always a three-body problem. Okay, mm. because yes, you can allow outdoor events, but outdoor socialising tends to lead to indoor socialising yeah. because that's just a behavioural pattern. Yeah, and uh, maybe we'll come on to um, <clears throat> the pandemic in a bit of a broader discussion as well. But maybe another couple of questions, Martha, if you've got. Another couple. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have one from Paul, which is how do you encourage more left field thinking in large corporations that are rooted in the established ways of doing things? I've wondered about this a lot. I think we need to change corporate governance. So there's a kind of so organizations kind of have a creative board. And the reason is you can't that this comes down to a really interesting thing. We don't talk about what's important. We talk about at work. In an institutional setting, we don't talk about what's important. We talk about what makes us look important. And economic and legalistic language has a higher status than behavioral or psychological or creative language. And I discovered this by being a non-executive director in a few organizations. I'd sit there as the marketing guy and they'd go, well, product X isn't selling very well. So we're planning to reduce the price by 4.7%, which uh, according to our models should result in a 3% uplift in the so-and-so, so-and-so. And I'd be sitting there while this conversation was going on. And what I wanted to say was, have you thought of making it pink? <laughs> okay, right. I, I, I mean, that as a hypothetical kind of marketing suggestion, you know. Or have you thought of changing the name? Have you thought of doing this? And I realized in the board meeting setting, you can't say that because it's a low status suggestion. It's a very male problem, I think. It's, it's exacerbated by maleness extreme maleness at board level, which is blokes kind of turn, turn things into a kind of rationality competition. But legalistic or financial or economic conversation has a high status and anything that's psychological or emotional has a lower status. So my argument is you've almost got to create a separate board. And the vital thing is that they're engaged in parallel right from the beginning. Um, I'll give you a lovely example of this. I, I talked to a company um, which is um, uh, an AI company, and one of the problems they were involved in was an engineering problem, which they used extremely advanced um, uh, machine learning to make an electric toothbrush quieter. Okay. And I said, this is really interesting because you're up against a problem here, which is there are about three cases uh, in design. Our belief in the power of the toothbrush is probably heavily related by the noise it makes. And the way we clean our teeth is why we use the noise of the toothbrush to regulate the pressure we apply to our teeth. OK. Because we can hear the motor slowing down, so we pressure off a bit. Then we hear the motor speed up and we pressure on and we use sound as a feedback device. Now, Raymond Lowy designed a very, very quiet fan back in the 1960s, and it was so quiet, people just thought it was ineffective and it wasn't cooling their room. And he had to introduce noise back into the fan so people believed it was working. OK, and he called this most advanced yet acceptable, Mayer. And it's the idea of a technological solution that has to be good, but it has to retain enough familiarity with what people have come to expect so that it's still a recognizably acceptable solution. Rolls-Royce went to Michelin. And if you buy a Rolls-Royce, if you buy a Rolls-Royce Ghost, I'm not, not saying any of us are going to do this. If you buy a Rolls-Royce Ghost, it's got weird tires which have foam in them, which reduce tire noise. 
when they attached these tires to the Rolls Royce Ghost, they actually reduced some of the soundproofing in the car because they said the car was now eerily quiet. It had become difficult to drive because people had no conception of the speed they were doing. And they actually had to remove some of the sound deadening because the car was so quiet, it was actually creepy. And so understanding that actually quite often rational people will set out to solve a problem, which is where the metrics they're trying to optimize are entirely misaligned with what people care about. In the case of you know, Tony Blair and the famous, you know, uh, the famous doctor's waiting times, doctor surgeries were incentivized to reduce waiting times. So they made it impossible to book an appointment two days in advance. OK, you had to ring back at eight o'clock the following morning because that way they met 100 percent of their target because everybody got to see the doctor in the day they'd asked for an appointment. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a if you're a person with a job, you actually need two days notice of it, of many discretionary doctor's appointments because you need to tell your colleagues you won't be in on Friday morning. You can't just suddenly ring work and go, I won't be in today because I've got a doctor's appointment because they assume you're hung over. And you got pissed the night before and you're not feeling very well. OK, right. You need to be able to say, by the way, I've got a doctor's appointment Friday afternoon, so I'll need to leave a bit early. OK, nobody says piss off. You can't do that. But you do need notice. And so they, the, the, the metric and the incentive that everybody was working to was actually at odds with patient well-being. Yeah, really interesting. Um, what, one more question. I, I will tell we'll, you a joke, we'll, actually, which is that 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 incident. Let me. I had to give a talk to a medical audience at the Royal College of General Practitioners, and I was nearly late to give the talk because I couldn't find the building. And in the end, I rush in, and I've got about three minutes to spare, and I'm rushed onto stage, given the microphone. I said, I'm terribly sorry. I'm, I'm arriving in such a flustered state because I couldn't find the building. And I said, I did think of ringing up and asking for directions, but I realised they'd just tell me to ring back at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> that, I mean, that, that was the kind of thing where bad metrics, not looking at the second-order effects or the unexpected psychological effects, can lead to really bad policy. Yeah. Yeah, really good. So one more, Martha, and then we'll, we'll, we'll move on and we'll come back to the questions again that uh, uh, remain in the chat. Yeah, so we've got a slightly more specific question from Rose, which is, can I get your thoughts and ideas on how we can get our residents on board with reducing our area's carbon footprint? Just play that part again. How can we get ideas on board? How can we get our residents on board with reducing basically the area's carbon footprint? Well, I'll give you a few ideas, um, one of which, which I love, okay. Um, uh, something that interests me, by the way, very much is I, 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 I was asked, my, my, my current energy tariff had expired. And I was offered the choice of just a new tariff or I could have the green tariff. The green tariff, the fully green tariff, in fact, it's not even carbon neutral, it's actually slightly carbon positive because as well as, are offsetting they also plant some trees or something okay um one thing is i mean one one thing is just re-greening is something that appeals to everybody i've often talked i said don't make this politically left-wing or right-wing i say this to extinction rebellion look if you talk to right-wing people the idea of rewilding is like music to their ears right you know ecology and you know to depoliticize the debate and don't always sell it on the basis of polar bears. You could sell it on the fact that trees are nice, you know, that sort of thing. I was intrigued to notice that the cost of actually going to a fully green tariff was 25 quid a year. Okay, it's about two pounds a month. It was inordinately less than I expected it to be. Now, one of the things I would like is, you know, I said, why don't you just give me some little novel, little um, uh, novelties which is why can't i actually see on my computer the um the windmill that's notionally powering my home okay the wind turbine that's notionally powering my home make it more salient okay you know maybe i should be allowed because i'm on green tariff maybe i should be allowed just to display something you know that, that says so uh, make it visible. So boiler replacement is a really difficult problem because you can't brag about it. It's probably the most important decision you can make in terms of reducing your carbon footprint. But making it tangible, making it salient is always good. Uh, that's one thing. T to be absolutely honest, I've got the British gas hive thing. You might have Google's Nest. Uh, 
To be absolutely honest, that probably reduces the amount of energy I use. But the reason I got it was as much novelty, convenience and, and reassurance. So one of the arguments I said is, look, don't necessarily sell everything on its environmental benefit, because what you're doing then is you're um, you're essentially it's kind of altruism exhaustion. OK, so with the, with the smart meter, I said the way to sell the smart meter is to actually say, put it next to your back door. OK. And what it means is that when you leave the house, you can check you haven't left anything switched on. OK. People's fear of house fires and, you know, hair straighteners and, you know, all those things is probably much more salient and immediate than their concern for the climate. Now, if you can sell the smart meter on the basis of put it by your back door and you can make sure when you leave the house that, you know, it should be at about a one to two p a minute level because that might be the fridge or your skybox. But if you're using electricity at 10 p a minute, you've left something switched on. OK, that might be the way to sell it through fear rather than altruism. Don't sell everything on the basis of altruism. OK, because uh, you need to reserve people's altruism for where there's no selfish solution. But another one I, that's always interested me, and I, I've spoken to people about this, is there are actually things you can do to reduce your carbon footprint quite a lot. Less appropriate in Westminster, where there's more multi-level housing. But just encouraging people to use their dishwashers, washing machines and tumble dryers at a non-peak time of day. OK, if you can shift people's discretionary heavy consumption electricity things. Now, to do that, all you need, not everybody's going to do it. Some people work nights. OK, if you work nights, I don't want people leaving the house, leaving their tumble dryer on. OK, because it might catch fire. OK. Broadly speaking, uh, it would be a good idea to encourage people to just delay, you know, delay the use of their washing machine by an hour or two, or maybe put on a dishwasher when it's 80% full at 10 o'clock in the evening, rather it's kind of nuclear powered. It's, it's kind of powered by renewables. Okay. Now, all you need to do this is to go and ask someone like Sky nicely. Can we just have a little dot on the screen that comes on occasionally? you know, which says this is a good time to use your washing machine. This is a borderline time. It's better to wait. And this is a bad time to use your washing machine. OK, now you're not compelling anybody to do anything, but you don't need everybody to act on this. If you can just get 20 to 30 percent of people to time shift their use of those appliances by 20 to 30 percent by removing the peaks from consumption, you massively, you disproportionately reduce the amount of coal power that's needed. And as a result, the effect on the carbon footprint is vastly in excess um, of uh, what you'd expect. You know, you're actually removing the very worst part of human behavior from the equation and you're doing it voluntarily. And I've always wondered why there isn't a sort of social movement around that or whether there's some movement where you say that this is just a voluntary thing, but it generally just helps the climate. The other thing, and I, uh, this letter was sent to me by someone when I was talking about the behavioural science of climate change. This was actually sent to me by someone working for BP on an oil rig in the South China Seas. But I think his point is nonetheless valid, we, which is to some extent talk about air quality and pollution, not only carbon dioxide, actually. Because I think that, again, it's more immediate, and it's more salient. Um, other things which really interest me, and I don't know the answer to this, I, you, you've got my, uh, I've, as you saw, I completely ducked that question about vaccine passports, and I'm going to think about it some more. What I do know about vaccine passports is if we can find a solution that's voluntary, or where people deliberately choose to display the fact that they've been vaccinated, okay, uh, you know, um, then actually, um, I think... Um, uh, I, I think we should prefer that solution to one that involves a degree of compulsion. And, and I, I, we need a, a big creative session asking what those things could be, okay, that would actually um, increase, uh, increase the likelihood of fairly widespread compliance. Now, on the question of uh, environmental behaviours as well, I think we need to look at voluntary behaviours. One of the things that interests me, though, is what about temporary behaviors and one of the weird things about legislation is it's always permanent now what interests me is i think if you did for a year i think the people of westminster might quite like car free sundays for it four of them a year okay because that's giving you an optionality that only exists with some degree of coordination 
And if you look at all the world's religions, they have things like festivals, which are synchronous, or they have Lent and fasting, which is synchronous, or Ramadan or whatever, okay? And there is a role in government in simply solving coordination problems by saying, you know, on these dates, we all do this, and on these other dates, we all do that. Okay, now, it does occur to me that four car-free Sundays a year in Westminster, you've got to make an allowance for emergency vehicles, you probably have to make an allowance for a few other things, um, but you'd have to apply in advance to use your car with a reason, okay? Okay, um, now, it's to a standard economist, that's welfare limiting, because if you prevent someone from doing something they want to do, it's by definition welfare limiting. Qatar is doing car-free days. I would argue that once you have a completely car-free day, which is something that nobody's really experienced, they're going to notice a whole load of positives which never occurred to them, which is like you talk to your neighbours or we actually walk to the shops. Or because it was a car-free day, our local restaurant had put on a special deal for locals where, you know, you could get a, you know, you could dine in the garden at 10% off if you lived, you know, if you live with, if you live within the locality. And businesses would start adapting in lots of clever ways to the car-free days until the car-free days became more fun than a standard Sunday, okay? They'd actually be something you look forward to. But it would take something like 12 to 16 car-free days in a row before people finally, this realisation finally dawned. And I don't know what the position is there for how we create an economic model that says that just as with COVID, which accelerated the use of video conferencing, the fax machine took off because of a series of postal strikes. And you don't know what a fax machine is, do you? I've suddenly realised. But that took off because there was a series of... It, the fax machine was invented in the 19th century. It never took off in business because it was a niche thing. And you bought a fax machine, you hardly knew anybody else to send a fax to. And it was a series of postal strikes in the 1980s that got it to critical mass. So my question for the world's political philosophers, there's a wonderful experiment where three London tube lines or four London tube lines went on strike and they looked at the traveller data and they discovered that a significant percentage of the people who'd had to adopt a new route into work because their normal tube line was on strike, a significant percentage of them stuck with the new commute after the strike had ended. And so the temporary imposition of a constraint forced a new behaviour, which in some cases turned out to be beneficial. So the extent to which we should look at legislation as a way of pattern breaking, and we don't have a mechanism for discussing this, but I think certain amounts of legislation, like on certain days you can't do this, on certain days we don't do this, pattern breaking legislation which creates greater variety in life, I think we made a big mistake with Keep Sunday Special. I think we should have said, OK, we get the fact people are busy. They work hard. You've got two income households. People need to do a grocery shop on a Sunday. You can't turn Sunday into a ghost town. But maybe the Keep Sunday Special Brigade should have said, can we just have four a year? OK, you know, can we just have four Sundays a year where it's kind of like, OK, um, you don't go shopping this Sunday? Just. Just, just, just to get, just to create more variegation in 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 behaviour. And the trouble with allowing everybody to optimise their own individual utility is it arguably creates a monotony of behaviour and a uniformity of behaviour which isn't utility maximising. If you see what I mean. Yeah. Uh, what was it? Sorry. I, I not. Uh, no, uh, so so I don't know. I don't know how we actually get around that. It's a bit. It's a bit similar to the tragedy of the commons, if you like. You see what I mean? Mm. Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's kind of like the forced simultaneous shock of the pandemic. And I, and I know you you've said before the kind of you know when a, a forced simultaneous shock happens, like the Second World War, for example, you get a change in women in the workplace. There was uh, no there was no reason women couldn't have been entering the workplace thirty years earlier. It would yeah. have happened. It would have taken twenty years longer without World yeah. War Two. You know, yeah, and so some of the four simultaneous shocks that we're going to learn from, or, or the changes in behaviour out of the pandemic, what what are the ones that you think are going to stick? Uh, business travel, flexible working are going to be sticky to an extent. I mean, there's a lot to be said in favour of them, and you might argue that the reason. I, I was an early convert to flexible working. I don't think this is a realistic experiment, by the way. I don't think having people under house arrest for 12 months 
uh, all working exclusively with Zoom with no freedom to meet their colleagues or to have a, or to even go to a cafe to work or to even escape anywhere else to work. I don't think that's a realistic test environment. OK. But what we can say confidently, particularly looking at the first few weeks when this happened, is it worked a hell of a lot better than everybody expected. OK, I actually thought there'd be a tech meltdown. I thought that Zoom wouldn't be able to cope with a sudden surge in usage. I, I was naively wrong there. I, I literally thought that the broadband network would fall over under the pressure of all this sudden use. Um, uh, it, I mean, Zoom happily is built for the cloud, so it's pretty good at scaling very fast. But, but interestingly here, uh, what really interests me, I think, is that that I think will change. I think patterns of, uh, I think there is the opportunity for a B2B and service industry explosion in productivity. And for this, I recommend a paper, a blog actually written by Noah Pinion, which is N-O-A-H-P-I-N-I-O-N, where he suggests, as does Robert Gordon, who's a major skeptic about technology and its potential to bring economic gains, he thinks we'll see a productivity surge uh, over the next 10 years in kind of service and um, knowledge work because of the ability to work in distributed ways without requiring co-location. I think the world will increasingly align a little bit along linguistic lines, not geographical lines. The number of conversations I have with India, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the US um, is, and Africa actually, has gone up in each case by a factor of 10 during the pandemic. The number of conversations I have with Europe, with the possible exception of Scandinavia, which is basically English speaking, okay, hasn't really changed. So I think we might actually see, you know, those people who are kind of Kanzuk believers, you know, who believe in basically, you know, creating a new free trade and free movement area between Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the UK. Uh, I think they might have uh, actually a much better case than they would have done three years ago. Um, uh, I, uh, and, and I, uh, so those are a few predictions. They're mostly video conferencing related, which I uh, admit. The other changes uh, I can predict but they're really complicated because psychologically, some people, I think, will react by becoming more agoraphobic and slightly more, you know, almost slightly more introvert. Because I mean, it's worth remembering in the workplace, it, extroverts bully introverts much more than the other way around. And there must be a bunch of people who've actually gone, you know, I'm actually. Uh, OK, here's another one. Retirement. Right. How many people retire because they want to stop work or do they retire because they want to stop commuting? Right. You're a 60 year old accountant. You're pretty good at accountancy. You like doing a bit of accountancy. You don't want to do it 40 hours a week, but you're pretty good at it. OK, the reason you retire isn't because you don't want to do accountancy anymore. It's because you've got a little house in Portugal next to a golf course where you want to spend three months of the year and you don't want to get up at seven in the morning and get on a crowded train. Now, you can still be an accountant without from your house in Portugal without getting on a crowded train suddenly. OK, so what does retirement mean under these conditions? OK, for knowledge workers in particular. Um, so there's some really, really interesting questions here. Now, the other ones are really complicated because depending on what category of goods you supply, are you selling essentials? Are you selling treats? Are you selling postponables or are you selling um, uh, effectively discretionary goods? The extent to which consumption in those areas will change after the pandemic will change enormously by temperament some people will be making up for lost time and you'll have a kind of roaring 20s effect in two or three years time perhaps other people the opposite other people will actually become slightly more reclusive i think um and so i mean the knock-on effects are going to be significant these things would have happened i mean these things were already happening okay I mean, at a small level, if you went to Seven Oaks Station car park on a Friday, the car park, which on a Wednesday was rammed by 10 a.m., was half empty. And the truth of the matter was senior I mean, Seven Oaks is, you know, tends to be, you know, it's people in their 40s, 50, knowledge workers in their 40s, 50s with kids who've moved out. OK, it's absolutely dormitory town. Now, those people of that level of seniority were working from home on Fridays already. OK, that was already happening, but it was don't ask, don't tell. They never made it official. They just basically said to their PA, you know, routinely calls to me, but I'll be at home on Friday. And they were all doing it to such an extent that I used to have a kind of WPP Kent club where a bunch of colleagues and us, uh, would meet up for a pub lunch around Seven Oaks on a Friday because we knew we were all going to be around. 
Um, so it was already happening. What happened was the Department of Transport had estimates that video conferencing would significantly um, affect the demand for travel. They all had that in their models, but they had it in 2030. And it basically happened, in, it happened much, much faster. And it was socially normalized much, much faster. So the, the knock on effects again, I mean, you know, Robert Crandall, the former CEO of American Airlines said, if you think the business travelers coming back in the volumes they did before, forget about it. You know, that's not saying nobody's going to travel on business, uh, but it's simply saying that those one day trips to Frankfurt probably ain't going to happen anymore. Mm, yeah. It's worth remembering, if you take a very cynical view of human nature, which I do, OK, bear in mind that one of the reasons you did that, there were various reasons you did the one day trip to Frankfurt. Part of it was costly signaling. It was commitment to your client to show how committed you were that you're prepared to travel and see them. And partly it was just social norms that it would have been weird to suggest a video call. You know, that was like asking for Dr. Pepper rather than Coke. You know, it was a weird thing to ask for. Part of it was, don't forget, that the alternative to your trip to Frankfurt was another day in the office. Right. OK, so there was a certain temptation just to break mm -hmm. the monotony of office life, to get on a plane, you know, enjoy the lounge, you know, maybe have a bit of a shifty around Frankfurt, uh, you know, maybe stay overnight in a hotel. It's a bit of a change. Got a few miles, you know, got a few fleet from flyer miles. Now, if the alternative is or you can just stay at home and get on with some work and chat to Jürgen between 11 and 12, that relative change, that relative thing. So we've got to look at we've got to look at asymmetries, right? Previously, you went and lived in Brighton. You were a dual income household. OK, what you basically had is you had two really expensive season tickets. You had 20 long rail journeys every goddamn week. And in return, you got two days by the seaside. What happens now is you have a, the equivalent of less than one season ticket, perhaps. OK, uh, OK, because you're only making eight journeys between the two of you every week if you're going in two days. OK, eight rather than 20 journeys. Less than 50% of the cost, assuming the government mandates the introduction of, of non-permanent season tickets, which has been something I've been campaigning for before the pandemic. It's very unfair to part-time workers. The whole notion of the season ticket is Victorian and absurd, okay? But in return for all that, which isn't all that much expense and inconvenience, you now get five days by the seaside, okay? And the fact that your house is a bit big makes a difference because you're working there, right? Okay? So the fact that you've got a nicer house with a bit of a garden is much more material when you get to enjoy it five days of the week rather than two. So it's not just a, it's not just what you might call a linear change. It's a whole change in ratio. And that disproportionality, I think, really matters. Mm. Brilliant. Now, uh, I, I think, we, Rory, if you're happy to carry on, I think we were <laughs> yeah, going to keep this to an hour and a half. But if, if you're happy to carry on, we could do maybe another 15 minutes and, um, uh, and get some more questions in the <laughs> chat. If that's you, okay. I'm happy to do that. Happily, yeah, yeah no brilliant. Um, before we go um, on, on to that, I just wanted to ask you a, a little bit about um, the use of big data and that kind of side of the rational decision making stuff using mathematics, predictive analytics, all of that kind of stuff. Um, because in the book, you're quite, look, you know, you, you're, you're better off not having a mathematician in the room if it's a poor mathematician. What's, well, what's there, there is a fundamental problem, which is the number of people who are vaguely capable mathematically and love using mathematics to arrive at a decision because by nature it's then easy to defend. You know, the algorithm told me to do it or the model told me to do it is the 21st century equivalent of I was only following orders at the Nuremberg trial. You know, it wasn't me. I was told to do it because now the extent to which people might outsource decision making to models in order to minimize blame strikes me as dangerous. The problem is there are far more reasonably good statisticians than there are great statisticians. And the problem is a reasonably good statistician can be unbelievably and spectacularly wrong. OK. I mean, to an extraordinary degree, if you get one thing wrong in statistics, you can be massively wrong. The other thing it will do is it will disproportionately privilege certain metrics over other metrics. So it will the model will disproportionately overweight things that happen to be numerically quantifiable. 
And so one of the things we have to look at is we have a world in the, I would argue, in the digital advertising where every single digital advertiser does things that are perfectly rational within their own information set in order to advertise to people in a way that demonstrably makes money through a click through rate. OK, so in that level, the advertiser is working for all of them. If you look at it from the consumer's eye view, most of the advertising I see online, despite the fact that I don't use ad blockers and I don't delete cookies with great frequency, the advertising I see online is completely irrelevant and disproportionate to the things I spend my money on. So advertising isn't working. And for advertising to work, people should see advertisements for things they already have bought or currently are thinking about buying or might be in the target audience for at some stage, or which they never even knew existed, but that's interesting to know because I never knew you could buy one of those, okay? That's what advertising should be doing. Instead, advertising is showing me the absolute opposite of that. It's showing me things I've already bought and don't need again, or it's showing me things that I buy very, very occasionally that I won't be buying for another six years. So if the advertising at the consumer level isn't working, the whole system isn't working. But in terms of their own individual programmatic algorithms, it's doing a great job. But it's not good enough to, know, to say what I am doing is rational within my own narrow constraint and bubble of rationality. If the thing systemically is bad, it's bad. And the algorithm isn't going to be looking at that because it doesn't know. Um, it doesn't know what it doesn't know. And so I, I'm deeply alarmed by this. Now, obviously, data is valuable. It's probably better to have it than not to have it. How you use it, most of the time we're using it like a physicist would, which is we're looking for averages. But the real valuable information in the data is actually in the exceptions. So we should be actually, we don't need an artificial intelligence. We need artificial inquisitiveness. We need things that go in and go, tell us some things about our data that are really strange and unexpected. And then we can in turn seek to go and explain them and understand them, which may be the basis for a really valuable insight. Mm. OK. And, and for that, you, you do need good mm. um, predictive analytics and somebody actually that isn't just good, uh, you know, a brilliant physicist or mathematician, but also understands advertising, also understands. I mean, the question, though, is what if you what if genuinely it's like weather forecasting where you just can't. OK. I mean, you know, you can, weather forecasting has got a lot better. You can now do an accurate five-day forecast and your seven-day forecast will be tolerable. A 20-day forecast is basically mathematically impossible, okay? It's unseeable. Now, what proportion of, um, uh, of stuff, Nassim Taleb's done some work on this where he said that, oh God, what is it? There's a certain thing, yeah, that it's impossible to isolate um, uh, uh, a genetic causality in things which don't have a single gene causing it that statistically that's just impossible to do <clears throat> because you you basically can't look at the combination of things so here the question is is are we spending now bear in mind that mckinsey you know delight the tech world and the advertising media world are in an unholy self-serving alliance to make the world all around data and targeting optimization right What's happening if we're spending millions of pounds essentially trying to use data to find out what data can never tell us? Never. It's like the four body problem, okay? You can predict movement with the, with the end body problem, but if there's a body that you don't know about, okay? If there's a body that, whose, whose weight and gravitational pull you don't know about, it's impossible to tell from your own movements what's going on, I think, okay? Now, um, uh, now, the interesting question there is, are we spending a fortune on literally spend, spending money on this data stuff? Um, basically, when what we really need is three really good heuristics. OK. Because in complex decision making environments, a really good non catastrophic heuristic, a heuristic which is non optimal because there isn't an optimal answer. The other thing is, is that it's anti creative because the way we use AI will always look for the single right answer. And my argument is that, the op that in the real world, as distinct from in physics, the opposite of a good idea can be another good idea because psychology is a non linear thing. Okay. <laughs> You know, you also have the Laffer curve, which is the opposite of a bad idea is another bad idea. Yeah. 
you know yeah. so a lot of things are like that and you can have an inverse laffer curve um and a lot of things just aren't that linear and so by looking for things which are kind of um there's another word for linear which is like mono something or other in other words they only trend in one direction even if they're not strictly linear mm. okay uh, you might get things totally wrong i mean totally monumentally wrong yeah yeah no, really, really interesting. And, and, and designing solutions for the for the average, um, and not looking at the kind of you know the the um, the probability stuff at the end of the curves is is, yeah. is a problem as well. Um, great. Can we take a, just a couple more questions, and then um, we'll we'll say thanks and and, and let um, let Rory go. So, is a couple more questions, Martha, in the chat? Absolutely. We've got a question from John, which is, what do you think needs to happen for blockchain currency to be adopted by banks and governments? A uh, very, very interesting thing, which is, um, uh, first of all, the, uh, the interface is currently terrible, by which I mean um, only people of a fairly high level of tech confidence and sophistication would be comfortable using it. My daughter actually got spoofed and had a tiny, luckily it was a tiny amount of blockchain stolen, um, but it was a fairly elaborate uh, spoof. Uh, one of the things is that government could play a role. I went to Zoom in 2018, because I said Zoom is just a little, little bit, it, it, psychologically it's an order of magnitude better than other video conferencing platforms. It, not better, less crappy, okay? Uh, you know, it, it's not that Zoom is utterly brilliant, but it had eliminated a lot of the flaws and psychological annoyances of other video conferencing platforms. And I said to the, I said to Zoom, I said, what would you charge the UK government to give Zoom to everybody in the country? Okay. And they went and they were actually really interested. And I tried to get in touch with government in 2018 because I said, conceivably, I mean, conceivably, right? The UK should just, one of the things we could do is we can solve problems at government level just by creating platforms. I think government should have created a micro payment platform for the facility of greater online commerce. I think government should have just said, okay, we're going to basically get contractors out and we're going to have a nationally instigated micro payment platform for content. I've suggested you bake it into the BBC license fee. So your BBC license fee comes with a year's worth of the BBC, but it also comes with 10 Zog units to spend on like a subscription to a newspaper or something else. OK, or or just a reading of one off things. And I think we could have created I think we should create a locker network for online delivery so that not everything has to be delivered to the home. I think the government should do that when you have a coordination problem. Government can just step in by saying this is our officially approved thing. You can use other ones if you want to, but Zoom is our officially approved um, thing. And actually what we're going to do is we're going to negotiate for saying that Zoom is our officially approved government solution to software, which you can safely adopt. We're going to negotiate for saying that uh, a discount to, for the UK population, which means you can have it for three quid a month rather than whatever it is, seven, whatever it is. OK, right. OK. Now, I think there are a load of things where technology, technological progress has stalled. Now, when you had a locker network, I designed the government locker network so that it was open and that local shops could use it. So I could get in touch with the website for the Seven Oaks bookshop and I could say, have you got a copy of this book in? And they go, well, we're getting one in tomorrow. I say, could you just drop it off in the locker and brace it, which is walking distance from my house, ideally. I mean, if it isn't walking distance from my house, maybe it's somewhere in a car park somewhere where I can easily go and pick it up, you know, on my next journey. But there should be a, you know, we should have a locker system. OK, um, you know, the government, if you like, created the postal service that way. You know, it created as an artificial monopoly, um, and it, you know, I mean, it was first created. Roland Hill had the extraordinary idea that if we drop the price and make the price universal, the increase in usage will eventually out, outweigh. I think it was one of the most important and innovative tech decisions in the history of the world. By the way, was the Universal Postal Service because it predated Henry Ford in the insight that with network effects you can make something cheaper and become more profitable. And I, and I, I think that that idea was a, a massive, massive idea. Now, I think government should be a, I mean, Deirdre McCloskey says, you know, your government procurement people presumably know a lot about what computer to buy, okay, which are reliable. Why don't you just tell us, okay? 
And one of the roles that government, government is bossy government and there's bribey government, but there isn't helpful government, right? Okay, there are loads of ways in which Deirdre McCloskey says, you know, you must know a lot about computers because you buy millions, billions of pounds worth of them every year. Why don't you just share that information with me? I can use it or ignore it, okay? But why don't you just do that? Why don't you make yourself useful to people? And also ask people how they can be helpful. So mutual reciprocal altruism between government and, and citizens is totally underexplored. You know, I mean, only a fool breaks the two, two second rule. It was a brilliant little heuristic for how not to tailgate on a motorway. OK, you, you, you count to two between the, the car in front and then you passing the same spot. And it takes two seconds to say only a fool breaks the two second rule. So it was a really useful thing instigated into the populace. There's a thing, OK, in driving smart motorways, classic example. OK, they spent billions on smart motorways. They didn't spend a penny on an advertising campaign to tell people how to use them. Because the smart motorway benefits from a completely counterintuitive thing, which is that by obeying a speed restriction, you'll actually get to your destination faster because it's diminishing the chance of gridlock forming. OK, now, nobody knows that it's completely counterintuitive, right? OK, for the same reason, by the way, don't walk on the escalator stand side by side at a place of high overcrowding actually gets more people on the escalator because when people walk on the escalator although they get off the escalator faster you've got to leave a, two empty steps between the people walking to stop them bumping into each other okay so when you have a counterintuitive thing that people don't instinctively grasp government I, you know I, now one of the things i'd say is i'd have two speed limits on a smart motorway i would have said i would have said maximum speed and recommended speed OK, maximum speed 60, recommended speed 53. OK, and the point is you do an advertising campaign that says when you follow the recommended speed, um, OK, you've got to allow people to go 55 because in Britain we don't like driving side by side with, alongside people. We like to be a bit faster than the car on the left so that people can actually change lane. It's not like the US where you're on the same stretch of freeway for 20 five miles alongside the same Mack truck okay we don't like that as Brits we like to actually overtake someone a bit okay but if you had recommended speed 52 maximum speed and then you might have recommended speed you know left hand lane 52 uh, uh middle lane 50 55 fast lane you know uh, maximum speed 60 and you gave people a target not just a limit okay what you would have found is you could have done an advertising campaign that said, I know it doesn't make sense, but if you follow these limits, you don't get a traffic jam, you know, at Clackett Lane. OK, so you actually arrive faster by driving slower. Now, you've got to tell people that no one's going to. I mean, seriously, unless you're a complexity physicist, you wouldn't have really worked that out for yourself. Right. You've got to tell people. And so there's so many things government could be doing, but it's actually been basically captured by lawyers and economists. So what it does is it has bossy, which is lawyers, and bribey, which is economists, and actually helpful, nice, you know, pro-social, you know, what can we do? There are loads of things, there are millions of things you could do, genuinely, innovatively, if you actually got out of that stranglehold of allowing economists and lawyers to define the problem in advance, which is something they unsurprisingly always do in legal or economic terms. Brilliant, brilliant, Rory. I think you know, that is such a great place to leave the discussion uh, because it's a real, real challenge, um, actually. And I think kind of you know, and thank you again for this morning because it, it's been absolutely fascinating and, and brilliant. And I think, you know, we, what you've done is you've outlined why we need to bring psychology into problem solving and communications uh, and given us some illustrations of where that can, can where I add one yeah. thing, yeah, which nobody's tried. OK, because I think this is really important. And Westminster could do it. OK, <coughs> or government could do it. Climate pledge. OK, now I asked a bunch of people, I, I had a carbon footprint the size of bloody Greenland because I used to do a huge amount of business flying. And I was at a meeting, unsurprisingly, overseas with a bunch of people who were also frequent flyers like me. And I said to 10 people, I said, if you could pledge credibly and your employer would accept it, that for environmental reasons, you don't fly for nine months of the year. OK, how would you react? And all but one of the 10 said, actually, secretly, I'd be delighted because I get sick of this. You know, don't get me wrong. I enjoy a bit of business flying. It's not nearly as exotic as it seems. Okay, now, here's my plan. Okay, There are a lot of things like that. 
But what we try and do is we're telling everybody to do everything. That's the problem of seeing like a state, because we look at the average and we go, we need people to do this. 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 Mm. So then you tell everybody you need to do this, 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 this and this. Now, if you presented people with a meaningful environmental choice architecture. Now, those of you who watch Countdown, OK, you know, where you get you get three from the top row, four from the middle. Right. You provide people with a list of 10 major behaviors. Eight smaller beha medium behaviors and 10 trivial behaviors and you say all you have to do you've got complete freedom of choice but you have to choose three big ones four big now maybe you're doing them already you know if you're poor you're not flying all year anyway right so you can tick that box immediately don't you know it's a bit like i can tick the box you know don't use a private jet for a year i can tick that box fairly easily because i don't use you know, right okay some of them people will tick already so they're feeling i'm making a bit of progress here because i'm already doing these three good things okay and on the left, you could have things like don't buy clothes for a year. It's very difficult to cut down on clothing. Clothing in the fashion industry is worse than the airline industry in terms of pollution. And like the airline industry, a lot of it's unnecessary, right? I mean, you know, I get emails, the new season's clothing. You know, sorry, you don't need to buy clothes just because the weather's changed. You know, spring was kind of fairly similar in 2020, you know, right? Now, here's the thing, right? You get people to say, you've got to do four things from the left. And it might be, OK, I'll pledge not to fly for nine months of the year. I'll pledge not to travel uh, into, you know, not to make any unnecessary business journeys, which can be done by video conference. I'll pledge to do um, to, the medium one might be I'll put my dishwashers on. I won't put my dishwasher on or my tumble dryer on between these times of day. OK. And if you gave people a choice which could be tailored to their own particular circumstances, you could get a lot of people doing a lot of things. But instead, we try and get everybody to do everything, which means that everybody does nothing. OK, because you either devote your life to this cause and become George Monbiot or you mm. effectively give up. Mm. Now, I think if the government issued a choice architecture for environmental um, sustainability, which just said, OK, it's up to you what you choose. You know, don't not buying clothes for a year, by the way, it's quite a weird experiment. I've just had an old pair of very good shoes sent off to be completely refurbished because that's allowable. Now, I've saved so much from not buying any clothes. I can easily afford to do really weird things like that. OK. And then you discover a new solution to a problem through, um, uh, you know, a temporarily enforced um, uh, restraint and um so I, I i think government could actually provide people with a menu from which mm. they could choose yeah and i think that could be extraordinarily valuable yeah yeah brilliant and so, and so i mean maybe i was just kind of thinking after this rory maybe it would be great if west co and um colleagues and your your colleagues could get together and maybe we do a kind of a list of 20 ideas or something or you know how something practical off the off the off the back of the discussion uh, so what would, yeah, i mean i could pledge to buy an electric car next time round. i could also pledge to you know you could get the government to get people to pledge to use um um I mean, i'm just so interested in this stuff mm. does anybody notice by the way that um the electric bus is a totally different travel experience because it's serene now i think there's an opportunity to destigmatize bus travel actually i think there should be first class on buses i think there should actually be a first class area in buses where you pay three quid but you get a desk only on electric buses but i you know i you know i think i think you could reinvent things in really really interesting ways mm -hmm. OK, because uh, uh, does anybody else been, notice this with electric buses, which I went on and thought, oh, it's just a load of hippie shit about electric. I mean, I'm not that cynical. I mean, you know, uh, it's just some hippie shit about electric buses. And unlike a normal bus, when you're stationary, it's like being in a kind of, you know, you know, in a kind of, you know, sensory deprivation tank. It's silent. Whereas a diesel bus, everything just shakes and rattles and makes a horrible din. Right. I was on a Boris bus and I was going, this is actually like a limousine. It's gorgeous. Electric taxi, similarly, much, much mm. nicer. So that's the other thing is emphasize the selfish part of the equation, not just the pro-social part. Yeah. Brilliant, Rory. Listen, I'm very conscious of the time. Um, we're going we're gonna to let you 
you um, let, let you go. But uh, thank you so much again for a fascinating discussion. And I, I think it would be really beneficial. Oh, let's get, let's get, we, we, lo we love local government because yeah. the advertising industry, first of all, because actually you're a perfect test bed. You can try something in Westminster. If it works, yeah. you can roll it out to 27 other councils. Our work with direct debits done with Worcestershire. You may not even know about that. Hereford, mm. was it Hereford and Worcester Council? Um, you may not even know about that work, mm, but it was getting mm. people to pay their council tax by direct debit. We've done work with the police in the Thames Valley Police, uh, getting people to use live chat rather than yeah. phoning them. OK, yeah. uh, people love live chat. It's really weird, by the way. That's one, something you should do with your call centre staff. Yeah, yeah. Um, Brilliant. And I, and I love, I love the, the thought of temporary four simultaneous shocks in agreement with communities in order to test things. I think that's a really... And the, the, the whole point about this thing is it's like libertarian legislation. If we, you know, we'll try it for, for eight weeks. And if we all do agree we don't like it, we'll get rid of it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Brilliant. So let, just um, remains for me to thank you again. It was a really great two hours. Um, I think we all got a, a lot from it. I certainly love the conversation. We'd love to have you back again at some point. And as I say, we'll, we'll definitely be in touch and uh, we'll, we'll map out some of these ideas so we've got something practical at the end of the discussion, if that's okay with, with you. Absolutely super, yeah. Delighted. I'd be absolutely delighted because I think the opportunity... I mean, really, there needs to be, just as there needs to be a policing centre, they're probably... And I know the economist who'd help you set this up. Mm. There needs to be a kind of ombudsman for behavioural intervention, as it were. A, um, a, the, my friend who's a brilliant Australian economist called Nicholas Gruen will help you do this, and I'll put you in touch. He's very, very helpful. But the idea being using local experimentation looks like a cost at first, because obviously experimentation, uh, you know, the costs are often more visible sooner than the, 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 the payback is. So the finance function will often tend to kill them because they look like a short-term cost even though there's a huge long-term benefit to it. But actually, it also only really pays if you have the information mechanism where one council's successes can get adopted by 27 other councils. Yeah. And once you've got that mechanism working in the medium to long term, uh, it's game-changing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, great. Thanks, Rory, again. And um, listen, thank you for everybody that's joined the call. Um, we'll be putting more of these um, events on webinars over the course of the year, and we'll um, speak to you about those. But great discussion. Thanks, Rory, again, for your time. Extremely generous. And um, I'm, I'm sure we'll be in touch again soon. It's a joy. Thank you very much. Please don't hesitate to get in touch. Any of great. you. We'd be delighted.